and welcome to this conference hosted by MS Focus, the Multiple Sclerosis Foundation. I'm your host, Deborah Foreman, the Educational Programs Coordinator for MS Focus, and I'm joined by Dr. Aaron Boster, who will be with us today for an entire hour answering as many questions as he can. Now I am delighted to introduce him. Dr. Aaron Boster is a board certified neurologist specializing in multiple sclerosis and related CNS inflammatory disorders. He decided to become an MS doctor at age 12 as he watched his uncle, Mark, suffer from the disease in an era before treatment was available. Dr. Boster, who grew up in Columbus, Ohio, has been intimately involved in the care of people impacted by multiple sclerosis, and he's been a principal investigator in numerous clinical trials, trained multiple MS doctors and nurse practitioners. He's also been published extensively in medical journals. He lectures to both patients and providers worldwide with a mission to educate, energize, and empower people impacted by MS. He lives in Columbus, Ohio with his son, Maxwell, and his dog named River. Thank you, Dr. Boster. We're thrilled to have you today, and I'm going to turn it over to you. We can start from the very beginning. Fantastic. Well, Deb, thank you so much for having me back. Um, this is an amazing organization. And I just want to commend you guys for your ongoing commitment to community and to education. Um, I really appreciate it. And so I'm delighted that I get to uh, answer some questions today. How do you want to play this? Should we go to the Q&A and start there? Would you like to read some questions? I'm actually going to read them all to you. And I'm going to alternate between not only the Q&A, but we have a chat. And we also awesome. have, we have live um, questions coming in from Facebook. Yay, that's awesome. Well, let's let's get to it. I'll navigate those for you. So um, somebody would like to know, how close do you think we actually are to a cure? That's a loaded question, huh? Um, I, I So how close are we to a cure? We're not very close to a cure. Um, I say that humbly. And I say that because our understanding of the immune system is incomplete. So our understanding of the, the, the pathophysiology of MS is incomplete. And I think until we have a better understanding of the intricacies of, of what is happening in MS and what's happening in the immune system at a very granular level, I don't think we're close to a cure. However, in 2022, we can do something very special today, right now. We can make MS boring. And so we don't cure most diseases. You don't cure diabetes. You don't cure um, hypertension. You treat them. And so if you have high blood pressure and you take a medicine and it makes it normal, you live a normal life expectancy and you, uh, you don't have a risk of stroke or heart attack. Good stuff. We can treat your MS and make it boring. And that's something that we can do today. And that's a goal of mine in my clinic. Great question. Yeah, let's go to... Let's see, there's somebody in chat. But that's not coming up. So we'll go back to Q&A. Can what we eat or drink cause faster or slower progression? This is a debated topic. And I think the jury is out about whether nutritional um, interventions can speed up or slow down MS with the exception of vitamin D. So let me talk about vitamin D. Then let me come back to the bigger question. It looks like if you have a low level of vitamin D pre-puberty, it increases the risk to develop MS. So that data looks pretty solid. Excuse me. And if you already have MS and you have a low level of vitamin D, there's a higher risk of progression. There's a higher risk of attacks. There's a higher risk of new spots supplementing vitamin D, getting your blood level above 50 seems to be protective. So that's one area where I do think um, the data is pretty clear. But there's a larger discussion about whether or not a diet can impact MS. And I don't, I have not seen evidence where a diet unequivocally can slow the disease down. I do feel very strongly that diet plays a tremendous role in MS as it relates to energy, mood, thinking and memory, um, and in symptom management. So if I use that line of reasoning, processed foods and sugar-laden foods are, dare I say, the devil. <laughs> and 
it's been my strong experience that when my patients indulge in heavily processed foods, fried foods, fast foods, sugar laden foods, they don't do as well. They have more depression, they have more fatigue. And when they cut sugar out of their diet, it is remarkable what happens. Oftentimes, Deb, they end up t- stopping various symptomatic medicines because they don't need them. So I do think that avoiding processed foods and sugar laden foods is a, a, a boon. I also feel that most of us are massively dehydrated, like really dehydrated. And dehydration worsens many symptoms in MS, not just bladder, but also bowel, spasticity, pain, cognition, mood. And so if you up your water game, that can really be impactful. Now, that was a great question. Uh, Thank you. You know, um, just one comment on that. I know that years ago, we didn't have water bottles. We didn't have um, plastic bottles, right? We had to bring a glass with us or yeah. find a container. Now they have a multitude of different kinds of ways to carry water with you. Yep. So for those that don't have um, the ability to hold a heavier cup, the drink, just buying a case of water and always having that with you really seems to help. Because yeah, there's... Like- there are several tricks. Um, you know, it's not uh, it's not the rage anymore uh, for places to give you straws. And some of my patients need a straw to safely swallow, so I have them carry one in their pocket. You know, put it back. I mean, there's a lot of things that you can do if you train yourself to drink a glass of water with each of your three meals. You're doing better than most Americans, frankly, and so. You know, just when you have your breakfast and you have your eggs and your bacon and your coffee, add a glass of water. Not that big of a deal. Great idea. What does it mean when a once come and go symptom becomes an actual constant symptom? So so the question is, if you have a symptom which used to be intermittent, it would be there and then it would go away, then it would be there and then it would go away. And now it's constant. What does that mean? And that's not enough information to answer the question. Now, one thing that absolutely means is you need to talk to your provider because there's been a change and we need to explore that change. It could be a new attack. It could be a symptom, a new symptom. It could be unrelated to MS. It could be because of progression. It could be a lot of things. And all we know from the question is that there's been a change. And so I would need to dig in and look at uh, medications that you've recently started or stopped and infections that you may or may not have. And then what else is going on? Probably do a neuro exam to try to get to the bottom of it. Thank you. Cam would like to know what your thoughts are on Kisimta. So Kisimta, which is uh, the trade name for Ufatumumab, I didn't make up either name, is a high efficacy medicine. So it's in the top tier of efficacy. It's a B cell depleter. So it's a drug that is in the family of rituxan, rituximab, ocrevus, which is ocrelizumab, soon to be joined by another one called ublituximab. And I, I, these names are hilarious, right? So, so Kisemta is in that group of medicines that work by identifying adult B cells and depleting them, knocking them out. It turns out, this is fascinating, that T cells attack your brain and spinal cord, but they can't do it unless the B cells help them. It's called co-stimulation. And I always use an analogy of my high school. So my graduating class was quite overcrowded. And there's, I mean, there's like, you know, gazillions of kids in a small school. And so there's a lot of bumping and bustling in the hallway. And sometimes two young men might bump into each other. And when that happened in my high school, there's only one way to solve that dilemma. You have to meet behind B building and punch each other in the face a couple of times. You know, they duke it out. And none of these young pugilists would show up to defend their honor without six of their very best friends. And the best friends egg them on. Go ahead, man. Whoop his butt. I got you. Now, in this analogy, the kid fighting is the T cell. But his friends are the B cells. Well, with Kisemta, we murder his friends. So he shows up to fight and he says, what? nobody's here. So he doesn't fight. He goes home. And that's literally what's happening with Kisemta. You're killing the adult B cells so that they can't get the T cell adequately riled up to attack you. Now, Kisemta is a shot that you take once a month. And 
you have to be okay with taking a shot. Um, but there's an advantage to being able to do something at home and not have to travel because the other monoclonals that I mentioned, like rituximab and ocrelizumab, those are infusions. And so I think Kisemta is a very nice drug. Thank you. Nicholas would like to know your thoughts or your experience with patients with MS and doing acupuncture. So I am an allopath. Uh, I have my, my degree is an MD, which means I was not trained in acupuncture. So, so when, I when I'm not trained in something, I was taught to call it um, complementary or alternative, just but because we weren't taught about it. And just because something is so-called complementary or alternative doesn't mean it doesn't work. It just means I wasn't taught about it. And I think acupuncture is a good example because here in the United States, acupuncture is considered complementary, but in China, it's a standard of care, right? So I have developed three uh, rules or, or guidelines for doing something that's not, uh, that's complementary. Rule number one is it can't be dangerous. And acupuncture is not dangerous. So I don't think there's any concerns there. Number two, it can't be too expensive. And only you can know for your family, the, you know, whether something's too expensive. So let's say for the sake of discussion that it's reasonable, right? So you can afford to get it. The third thing is it can't be instead of something that I know works, it needs to be in addition. So if you came to my clinic and said, hey, Dr. Boster, uh, I would really like to do some, some chiropractic manipulation. I wanna do some acupuncture. I wanna do some X or Y. In addition to my MS medicine, I would say, oh, that's awesome. Let me know how it goes. And if it's helpful, then tell me so I can tell other patients. But if you said, hey, I'm going to stop my fill in the blank drug and I'm just going to get acupuncture or acupressure, I would be nervous about that. Thank you. That's a great answer. So Lena's asking, um, well, actually, she wants to know what you think about this. She's been eating whole foods, some non starchy foods, low carbs, veggies, and some berries. Um, she's cut out most processed foods and sweeteners, soda, and drinking mostly water now. Um, she's down 30 pounds so far and feeling so much better. I'm slowly adding more movement. What are your thoughts? Freaking unbelievable, amazing. Stomp my feet, clap my hands, throw my underpants on the stage, light things on fire. That's brilliant. Phenomenal. Yeah, I think that's superb. Wonderful. Good going, Selena. Have you seen good results? Jen's asking um, using Ocrevus. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving to you as well. Um, I think we have a lot to be thankful for this year. Um, I think Ocrevus is probably one of the most effective drugs that I've ever used in my practice. So I, I like it very much and I use it a lot because I think it's very effective. And Susan would like to know what's happening with BTK? So, so BTK is not the initials of a serial killer in this context. Um, in fact, when I first learned about brutine tyrosine kinase inhibitors, and I told my then wife, hey, you know, I'm studying BTK. She said, oh, bind, torture, kill, which I said, what? So it turns out there's some crazy serial killer that was named BTK. That is not what we're talking about. So, so brutine tyrosine kinase is a component of B cells and microglia. These are immune cells. And when you inhibit them, you prevent them from talking to other cells. So when you give someone a BTK inhibitor, which is a little pill, it blocks B cell communication without murder, which is very clever, right? So we were just talking about Kisemta and Ocrevus, which are two very effective drugs that work by depleting or murdering B cells. BTK blocks B cell signaling without murder. So it's kind of like going like, la, 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 I can't hear you, but, it, but it's not killing the cell. So there's less of a risk of infection, which is awesome. Also, BTK inhibitors can do something that we've never been able to do yet with MS medicines. It can enter into the brain and turn off a cell in the innate immune response called microglia. And you're going to hear a lot more about microglia in the next couple of years. And so it looks like an extremely promising therapy because of these novel ways that it works. 
Now, presently, BTK is being studied uh, by multiple different manufacturers. So Merck Serono has a drug called Evo Brutinip, and that drug has completely enrolled for the clinical trials and it's running. And so we're going to get a readout in a couple of years. And there's a drug called Tolubrutinip, which is made by a company called uh, Sanofi. And that a uh, relapsing trial is completely uh, close to enrollment and we're running the trial and I'm involved in that investigation. Um, the same drug, Tulabrutinip, we're studying primary progressive MS in a trial called Perseus and secondary progressive MS in a trial called Hercules and I'm involved in those trials. Now there's um, a, a, a BTK molecule made by Novartis. There's a BTK molecule that just came out in phase two by Biogen. And so my point here is there's a tremendous effort from multiple different manufacturers with uh, MS investigators like myself worldwide to study and develop these medicines. And I think we're going to see a readout in 2024. That'll be the earliest readout. Now, if I, if I predict the future, because we don't know what they're going to show yet, I think they're going to be an, a, a really valuable addition to the MS armamentarium. And where I'm kind of most excited about where they could be used is with a one-two punch where we do an induction and then we follow it up with BTK as a maintenance. Um, and so, so more to come. Uh, it's really starting to get exciting. Thank you for asking about it. Me too. Jenny said that she has optic, she had optic neuritis and never regained her sight in her left eye. My right eye, she says, was negative 0 0.5, but on DMT to Sabri, um, she now needs plus six magnifying glasses to see. This has happened over 12 months. What can I do or take to save my sight? So, so first of all, I'm sorry that, that you're going through that. And that's scary, right? I mean, we only have two eyes uh, and, and Unfortunately, sometimes when people have an optic neuritis, the vision doesn't come back. Now, most of the time with MS, it does, but not always. And as this gal points out, she's not a textbook, she's a human. And unfortunately, the vision didn't fully come back, which makes the vision in the fellow eye really, really, really important because that's the only seeing eye. Now, we're told that over 12 months, her vision's changed. And I don't have enough information to know why. And so we must get ye to the ophthalmologist ASAP so they can look in your eye and try to figure out what's causing that. Once the ophthalmologist can identify what's causing the change in vision, then we know what to do. Is it as simple as needing new glasses because your eyes change shape as you get older? Is it um, a, a problem that's not related to MS like glaucoma uh, or a cataract? Or could it be an MS problem? And so I think it's incumbent upon us to go to the eye doctor and get a checkup right away. Thank you. Um, I'm going to read this from Beth, but there's a few words that I'm having difficulty pronouncing. So I don't know if she just misspelled them or I just don't know the words. So I'll, I'm hoping you can help with this. Um, Beth says, can you talk about stroke recovery while having MS, such as an infarct from the corona radiata radiata into the basal ganglia yep so uh so this is a complex question and it speaks to the fact that people are not textbooks so nobody is an ms right somebody is like john who happens to have ms right he also happens to have a hobby and a wife and a da -da -da, right like so we're humans and here's an example of someone who happens to have ms and as my mentor used to say, nature's a little too generous. And they also suffered a stroke. Now, the recovery from a stroke in MS are actually separate entities. They're caused by different problems. MS is caused by inflammation in demyelination, where you strip the plastic coating off the wire. A stroke is caused because you cut off blood supply to a part of the brain, and so that part of the brain dies. And it's been my experience that recovery from stroke is not, it's not necessarily interfered by MS. Now, if you have an MS problem and you have a stroke problem on top of it, right, then, then we have to learn how to navigate that. But I've never really seen a, a conundrum where the MS makes it hard to rehab from the stroke. 
Now, one thing that's very important is, is secondary stroke prevention. So, you know, as we like to say, you're not dead yet, and you're at risk of having a second stroke, God forbid. And so we want to, in addition to living your best life related to MS, we want to reduce cardiovascular risk factors so that you don't have uh, as high of a risk of a second stroke. Thank you. Teresa is asking, is 60 milligrams of prednisone daily for 30 days without tapering effective for PPMS? Bah! That's terrible. I, um, ha ha. So no. So 60 milligrams is inadequate to enter the central compartment. So 60 milligrams is not a high enough dose to get into the brain. And giving someone 60 milligrams for a month sounds like not a good idea to me. That's something that's done sometimes with rheumatologic conditions like psoriasis or rheumatoid arthritis, but that doesn't work in MS. Um, and it would shut down your adrenals and it would uh, threaten your, your bone density. And, and I've never in my 17 years seen uh, PPMS treated that way. So, so that doesn't sound awesome to me. Now, that's my opinion. And that doesn't make me right, right? Uh, that just makes me opinionated. And so I would take the information back to my doctor and say, are you sure? Um, and are there other options? Because the answer to the question is yes. Thank you. Um, Teresa is asking, is IVIG or plasma exchange effective for PPMS? Great question. So first of all, what is IVIG and what is plasma exchange? So IV means intravenous. So that's where they put a needle in your arm, intravenous. IG is immunoglobulin, which is a scrabble word for antibody. So an antibody, the real word is an immunoglobulin. So IVIG is when you put antibodies in your vein. And the way they collect it is when people donate blood, they separate the red stuff from the other stuff. The other stuff has a bunch of antibodies in it and they collect tens of thousands of donors and they sterilize it. So it's, you know, it's not risk of being uh, infected. And then they run that in your body. And when you have an autoimmune condition, you can have autoantibodies, naughty antibodies that will attack yourself. And so if you flood the body with hundreds of thousands of other antibodies, some are going to bind to your naughty antibodies and pull them out. And so it's a way of treating an autoimmune condition. Plasma exchange accomplishes the same goal by doing the exact opposite. So plasma exchange typically involves putting big IVs in your neck. Oftentimes they're, they're not normal IVs, they're special. And they take your blood and they run it through a machine which is like an oil filter. And it filters out the big molecules like the antibodies. And then you put the blood without the antibodies back into the human. And so with IVIG, you bind up and pull the, the auto antibodies out of solution. With phoresis, you pull them out by cleaning them out. And they really uh, do the same goal. Now, IVIG and phoresis are used in several different autoimmune conditions. Um, other ones that are not related to MS. I have the most experience using uh, phoresis or IVIG when someone has an MS attack, gets steroids and doesn't respond. Then we'll go back and use IVIG or phoresis. And there's data that about 50 to 60% of MS attacks that don't respond to steroids will respond to phoresis. And so we, we sometimes use that as what we call a rescue. Now, the question was about PPMS, and the answer is it's unknown, but it doesn't look like it. There are some clinicians around the country, including some really top-notch guys like Bupender Khatri um, in uh, Wisconsin, and they will use phoresis to treat um, secondary progressive multiple sclerosis, but that's not PPMS. Um, I am not familiar with using IVIG uh, for PPMS, and the data doesn't really support it. Um, but I don't know that it's been adequately studied. Thank you. Um, JC, I'm sorry if I'm not going to say this the way you're writing it, but I'm, the question is, do some of the symptoms look like vertigo? And I don't know if that's a question as to whether you can get vertigo or do they just look like that? So the word vertigo means a hallucination of spinning. So like you feel like you're spinning or you feel like the room is spinning. That's what vertigo means. And the reason I bring that up is in common parlance, sometimes we say the word vertigo when we mean something else. 
So sometimes when someone's lightheaded, like they stood up too fast, they feel like they're going to pass out. Um, a doctor will call that presyncope, but um, someone may say, oh, I'm, I have vertigo, right? Just they may use that word to mean lightheaded. Similarly, if you're drunk um, or stumbling, kind of don't have your sea legs about you, that's disequilibrium, but sometimes people will call that vertigo. So the first thing is we just need to clarify that to a neurologist, the word vertigo means I'm spinning, right? And so then the question is what causes vertigo? So many things cause vertigo and the most common cause of vertigo in MS is not MS, it's a, a condition called benign paroxysmal positional vertigo or BPPV, where the hairs in the inner ear get stuck and so it's kind of like your turn signal is stuck on and your brain is being told you're turning, but you're not. And the physical therapist can do this thing where they move your head around called Epley maneuvers and get it to stop. Um, we actually had a patient in clinic today who had vertigo. She has MS, but the vertigo was caused by BPPV. And my nurse practitioner fixed it by doing these fancy Epley maneuvers. Now you can have vertigo because of a problem with the ear. Um, and there's things like labyrinthitis, there's infections that you can get that will cause vertigo in the peripheral ear. But MS, of course, can cause lots of different kinds of vertigo, and it can be really challenging to treat. And so there are centers in the base of the brain, if they're affected by MS lesions, can cause vertigo. Uh, and so that's something that we see, unfortunately, not infrequently. Thank you. Uh, Karen's asking about temperature sensitivity. Why do some people with MS get it and some don't? What's the actual cause and does it ever get better once you have the symptom? So great question. Um, it turns out that many people impacted by MS have uh, changes in their symptoms if they get overheated or if they get too cold. So let's take both scenarios. And we'll do cold first just because it's a faster discussion. So when people impacted by MS get cold, it increases the risk of having spasticity or spasms, cramps, charley horses. So I practice and live in the great state of Ohio, which is freaking cold and it's cold outside right now. And many, many of my patients are noticing they're waking up super stiff because it's colder outside and they're still while they're sleeping and they wake up and they're really, really stiff. Um, not everyone with MS has spasticity, about 60, 70% of people do. And not everyone with spasticity always gets worse when it's cold out, but oftentimes that's the case. Um, and, and knowing that allows us to be uh, thoughtful uh, and try to keep ourselves warm to avoid quick changes in temperatures going inside, outside, various things that we can do, or moving to Florida. Now, Warmth, heat is another set of uh, symptoms that, that uh, is another temperature that can cause problems in MS. In some patients with MS, when they get overheated, their nerves where there's been damage in the past literally short circuit. Now, I have a YouTube channel and on my YouTube channel, I've made multiple videos where I draw out what happens when you're overly heat sensitive. I don't have any paper and pencil to kind of show you right now. But in essence, when you have demyelination and you strip the plastic coating off the wire, the wire doesn't work anymore. The wire is your nerve. And your body goes in and fixes it, but it doesn't fix it very well. It fixes it kind of like kind of chintzy. And that's fine unless you heat the system up, like by going outside and running or living in Tampa or getting overheated during sex. And if you raise your core body temperature, that chintzy wire short circuits again. When your body cools back down, then it's fine. Now, not everybody has that pathology. Why? Because where MS attacks occur is different in every single person. Twin sisters with MS will have spots in different locations. And so it's really, um, you know, bad luck that you happen to have heat sensitivity. Now, if you have heat sensitivity, have I ever seen it change? Yes. I've seen people that didn't have heat sensitivity develop it. And rarely, sometimes I see someone who's been really heat sensitive have a summer where it's not a problem. Fortunately, there are ways of treating heat sensitivity. So being in water can be very helpful because it wicks the heat away from you. Great place to exercise in the water. Um, cooling your body with cooling vests, cooling kerchiefs, uh, uh, having someone walk behind you and pour water on you constantly all day long, whatever it takes. 
Um, or there's a medicine called for aminopyridine, Ampira, which has to be prescribed. And in about 50% of people, it buttresses them against heat sensitivity. So they can take that pill twice a day and they can have at it in the Florida heat and they don't melt. Wonderful. Before we get too far away from your conversation about um, the vertigo, somebody just asked if stress can be a common cause of vertigo. Nobody goes home at night and says, honey, let's get stressed out, right? That's not a conversation. Um, and stress, in my experience, can intensify baseline symptoms. I'm not convinced that stress can cause a brand new attack, but I feel very, very confident in saying that getting stressed out will intensify any baseline symptom. So if you have a history of vertigo and, you know, God forbid there's a psychosocial stressor, something serious is going on, it could intensify. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Teresa wants to know, is a lumbar puncture mandatory for the diagnosis of MS? So when you say mandatory, we have to kind of like discuss what that means. Is it required for the diagnosis? No, you can make the diagnosis other ways. Um, but it's, it sometimes is necessary to prove the diagnosis. Now, there are places in the world, like in Buffalo, New York, where they tap everyone as part of the diagnostic workup. And in most places in Europe, they tap everyone as part of the, the diagnostic workup. Um, most American neurologists, however, were a little bit more judicial uh, about how we do it. So if you have a, a story which is highly consistent with MS, with exam findings that support the story, and you have certain features on your MRI, we can make the diagnosis based on the 2010 or 2017 revised McDonald criteria, and we don't need a lumbar puncture. But if you don't meet all the criteria with your MRI, sometimes a positive lumbar puncture is enough to then provide the diagnosis. So it really depends. Okay, PMS, is it normal to see that walking is getting slower? I am also in a clinical trial. Yes. Thank you. And Cam wants to know, um, let's see, I relapsed right when I caught COVID. Five weeks later, I'm still having symptoms. Do you think COVID plays a part in prolonging flares? Yes, big time. COVID is not the flu. COVID is a nasty monster. And um, COVID oftentimes causes what's called a pseudo attack, where during the prolonged febrile illness, you have many of your MS symptoms come out and visit you. And oftentimes when the COVID infections cleared, the neurological symptoms persist uh, sometimes weeks. And so my um, observation has been, we need to hold tight and support you and allow your body time to recover. Now, this is completely anecdotal, what I'm about to say, but in some cases, in that scenario, I've given people low-dose steroids, not steroids for MS, but like low-dose steroids, and that seems to help with some of the um, residual symptoms. That's just conjecture. That's, that's just something that I've done in my clinic. She says, I'm currently on Ocrevus, which makes me immunocompromised. At what age, with what condition, would you start talking to patients to, to perhaps consider, reconsider taking or not taking DMTs that make them in, immunocompromised? Um, as at what point or what conditions would you think DMT makes it worse for immunocompromised people to continue taking the DMT? So, so the question is, um, if somebody's on a medicine which works to control their MS by suppressing part of their immune system, that increases the risk of infection potentially. And is there a time when someone reaches a certain age where that's not a good idea? So I strongly encourage all of us to avoid ageism, right? Ageism is not okay. And just because you celebrated a particular birthday does not mean that you should no longer be on a given MS medicine. I bring that up to you because there are some really goofy doctors out there that think that. And they'll say, ah, well, you know, you've done really well and you're 55, so we can stop. And that's BS. So the, the risk benefit 
of any drug is a moving target. Your risk of a therapy might change as you age. And this is an example where the risk benefit of being on an immunosuppressant when you're 30 is less than when you're on an immunosuppressant when you're older. I have plenty of 60 and 70 year olds on Ocrevus and they're crushing it. I also have a handful of 30, 40 year olds that had recurrent infections when I put them on Ocrevus and so I took them off. And the answer to my, my answer to your question is if the person is demonstrating that they're having increased risk of infections, even a bunch of little infections, couple UTIs, couple uh, upper respiratory tract infections, that's a concern that that person, um, the immunosuppression may be a problem. And in that person, we might change uh, to a non-immunosuppressant. But immunosuppression is not a dirty word. It's a very good word. And it's a great way of treating MS. I also want to point out that there's ways of mitigating the risk of immunosuppression. And I'll use your example of Ocrevus, right? So a lot of times with Ocrevus, we have concerns surrounding infection and COVID, right? So timing vaccines, taking Evusheld, and having Paxlovid available, God forbid, if you get infected, has done wonders for my patients, um, and allowed us to feel more confident in continuing their treatment with immunosuppression in the pandemic. Catherine says, when we talk about increased risk of infection from B cell depletion therapy, Ocrevus, does that mean you are more susceptible to both bacterial and viral infections? And what do you recommend if you have a sick child in your house, in addition to the obvious masking, cleansing, hand washing, open windows, do we need to isolate from them, for example, stomach flus? So you do not need to isolate um, your mom. You could take care of your kid uh, and you don't need to isolate. Um, wearing a mask is great. Um, I, I'm not even sure that's necessary to be blunt. Um, the risk of an upper respiratory tract infection on Ocrevus is about five to seven percentage points higher than Rebif. And the risk of a urinary tract infection is a couple of percentage points higher than Rebif. Now, in my experience, um, I can count on two hands the number of patients I had to take off therapy because of recurrent infections, and they were all in their 60s or older, um, with a couple rare exceptions. Those 30-year-olds I mentioned are, are an exception to that rule. Um, and I think that, that, yes, you're at slight increased risk, but we, you know, we're going to live our life. You take an MS medicine to live your life, not to avoid your life. Um, and I... I think that it, what's important is, is if you have an infection, we treat it with antibiotics. And if you have more than one, well, then we're going to look critically at, at the risk that drug provides. But I definitely don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Good point. Um, Jen wants to know, how do I know if there's axon damage when looking on an MRI? So one way to tell if there's axonal damage is to look for the presence of what we call black holes. So... Um, a T1 hypointensity is a doctor word for a black hole, which on the MRI looks like a hole. And it is. It, it's, it's a situation where the inflammation caused by the lesion is so intense, it eats away at the tissue. And the darker the color of the hole, the less axons are present. Now, there's other ways of measuring axons that are fancy pants, um, but they take special techniques. Um, another way that you can uh, look, kind of think about axonal loss is by brain volume. So the size of the brain and in the setting of untreated MS, the brain can shrink upwards of 10 times faster than normal. And so if there's a lot of brain volume loss, we have to assume that there's a bunch of axonal loss as well. Beck says that if her husband had swallowing problems before a stroke and now has asphagia, um, after it, because he also has MS, how do I know these symptoms are because of MS or are they because of the stroke? Why does it matter? So managing aphasia is the same whether you have MS or, or if you have a stroke. You're going to work with a speech pathologist who is going to retrain the brain. So I understand the confusion, but I don't know how relevant it actually is when it comes to the rehabilitation. Um, Catherine says she's new to Ocrevus and MS, just diagnosed in July of this year, and hear a lot online about crap gap. 
where people get worse shortly before the next treatment. Is this a real thing doctors acknowledge or is this just observational by the patients? It's a uh, debated topic. Um, so some patients have described that a couple weeks leading up to their infusion, they feel more fatigued or some of their old chronic symptoms may come back out. And then when they get their infusion, that goes away. And they've, they've termed that crap gap. And I think, I, I personally think it's real in some patients. Um, now, the reason I say it's debated is there's been some doctors that have done some research trying to understand it and they can't find anything biologically present. But I don't think my patients have all band together to make something up like, oh, let's tell Aaron. You know, I don't think they're doing that. And what I have found is most people do not have crap gap. The vast majority do not. I would not avoid uh, a highly effective medicine ochromis because of a fear of that. Not at all. Uh, I will share with you in some patients of mine who do have crap gap, uh, we have a little uh, maneuver that we do. A month before their ochromis, I give them one slug of steroids and they coast into their month without any symptoms. And it seems to work really well. So um, I do think it's probably real. I think it's, um, I think it's rare. Uh, and I think people on the interwebs don't talk about boring, right? So if things are going well with Ocrevus, they don't talk about it. Nobody's going to be like, oh my God, I have my therapy and nothing happened. You're only going to really talk about things generally if something un unpleasant happens or if something amazing happens. And so the reason I bring that up is the, the, the representation of people's experience on Facebook is terribly inaccurate. Uh, it's, it's actually um, uh, kind of a bad place to uh, learn sometimes because there's an echo chamber. So you're in a closed Facebook group. And if someone says a shenanigan that's not true, nobody's there to combat it. If you say the same shenanigan on Twitter, you know, experts will descend upon you. And, blah. and so I just caution to make sure that you're not um, subjecting yourself to that. Sage is saying that they live in a rural community with three Fortune 500 companies, and her husband was diagnosed with um, primary progressive MS in 2012. We honestly don't have a neurologist that even understands MS. Where is your clinic, and where do I need to try to bring my husband for real treatment? He has no spleen, so the, the meds are usually out. So... First of all, um, your husband's lucky to have a partner like you. So that's really cool of you. So thank you. Second of all, I don't, I'm not scared of no spleen. I have lots and lots of options to treat him without a spleen. That doesn't phase me. Thirdly, I agree with you that um, primary progressive MS uh, takes uh, some expertise. And if the general neurologist uh, isn't comfortable, it might make sense to travel to um, a subspecialist, even just for like a once over to like figure out a game plan. Um, so, you know, I see patients from all over the United States and all over the world. Uh, and I'm in central Ohio, I'm in Columbus, Ohio. And could you come see me? Of course you could, but you don't have to. There's, there's a host of really, really top-notch MS neurologists scattered around the United States. Um, now, if you, if you want to come see me, I'm honored. Uh, but what I would definitely do, whether it's me or Ben Thrower or somebody else, is I would identify one of us um, and I would seek out an opportunity to go to a comprehensive center where they're going to do a soup to nuts evaluation and at minimum share a treatment plan, tick, 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 that you can then take back. Now, oftentimes we use medicines like Ocrevus to treat PPMS and that's twice a year. And so I have a lot of people that fly in from Texas twice a year to be treated at my center. Um, and so there are options for things like that. It uh, takes a little bit of legwork. Thank you. Lee is asking about her MRI. Uh, my MRI report showed several small flare hypersensitive, hyper intensities of the supra. Tentorial white Thank matter. Thank you, Cere cerebral matter. According to my neurologist, they are not consistent with MS. I've had many symptoms for about a year and a half, out and a half. My neurologist says about 20% of PPMS patients do have, do not have lesions rather. And is this true? So there's a lot that you said. Let's take it in reverse order. What they said about PPMS is false. So 
So in order to have primary progressive MS, you have to have at least a year of progressive decline in function. And you have to have two of three um, uh, ancillary things. And that's either spinal fluid in a certain number of spots in the brain, or spinal fluid in a certain number of spots in the cord, or a certain number of spots in the brain and cord. And so uh, you cannot have any form of MS with no lesions. So um, I'm not sure what that clinician meant, but just to be clear, nah. -uh. Um, now, I'm trying to remember the question backwards. If you have an MRI and it shows a spot, it doesn't mean it's MS. Um, lots and lots of things can cause white spots. So if I started to use like a black magic marker at the top of this wall, and I wrote things that can cause a white spot, I would get down to the floor and not be done listing things that can cause white spots. I smoked a cigarette when I was 12. I banged my head when I was 14. I took a birth control pill. I took a cholesterol pill. I had a high blood pressure. I mean, I, I can go on forever. And the, the, the MRI report it, to me is not useful. I, I joke that you use it to roll up and smoke, right? Because what I wanna do is look at the pictures. I don't care about the report because if I don't know the radiologist, I have no idea whether what they said was true. So I need to see it myself. And I would encourage you to sit down with the, radio, with the neurologist and say, okay, please point to the lesions and explain to me why you feel they don't look like MS. And probably what they're going to say is the size, the shape, the location, and the behavior after contrast did not match what we see in multiple sclerosis. Um, but that's conjecture because I haven't seen your scan. Thank you. Lee is asking about her MRI. Um, well, no, sorry, that was already done. Nicholas, are you more common to experience optic neuritis with more brain lesions than spine lesions? So, so the optic nerves are part of the central nervous system, as are the brain and spinal cord. And the optic nerves, the spinal cord, and the base of the brain are the most common places we see attacks. But that's because the tissue, the term in neurology is eloquent, which means it's at high risk of being damaged and there's no workaround. I'll use the optic nerve as an example. The optic nerve is thinner than my pinky and there's only one on the left. And so if it takes a hit from inflammation, there's no workaround and you're not gonna see. When humans don't see, they run to the doctor. And so optic neuritis never goes unnoticed almost ever. The same size lesion in the brain can go completely unnoticed because your brain rewires. So it gives you a false sense of things because certain symptoms take you to the doctor, other symptoms you may not know to go. David would like to know your thoughts on Lemtrada. I think Lemtrada is the most effective drug I've ever used in my career. Um, I think Lemtrada is completely underappreciated and underutilized by the vast majority of MS providers. Um, I am very disappointed and sad that the manufacturer is no longer able to support uh, Lemtrada um, and, and, and uh, <clears throat> help the way that they used to with marketing and sales and stuff. Is a 19-day steroid course a good treatment for a pseudo-relapse flare? It starts off with a six, 16 milligram, with six 16 milligram pills for seven days, then five for two days, four for two days, three for two days, two for two days, one for two days, and then a half a pill for two days. How many story treatments in a year is too many? This would be my second. Too many? Um, I don't have enough information to be able to answer you. Uh, I, that is not how I treat MS attacks at all. I use high dose uh, steroids, either high dose oral or IV, mu like much, much, much higher than what you're talking about. And then I don't do a taper. If I need a taper, it's a two or three day taper. And so that's not the way that I treat MS attacks. Now, does that mean what you're doing is wrong? I don't know. I don't have enough information. Teresa would like to know what you think is the most effective DMT for PPMS. So the only DMT that has been proven to the satisfaction of the FDA and the European EMA is ocrelizumab or ocrevis. 
And Scott wants to know what is the most encouraging advanced effort study to repair myelin and reverse MS symptoms? He wants to know what is the most encouraging study to repair myelin and improve MS symptoms. So, so remyelination is a very um, exciting concept. It's the idea that could you get the oligodendocytes to turn back on and to re-coat the nerve with the plastic coating, put the myelin back on the nerve. And we've been trying to do that for a while and we failed thus far um, in prior investigations. Now, there's several clinical trials that are currently ongoing and we hope to have readouts in the next couple of years. And so we're very desirous to have a remyelinating agent. In my opinion, if we're going to try to really beat the disease, we're probably going to need three different kinds of therapies. We're going to need an anti-inflammatory, and all of the current DMTs are anti-inflammatories. We need a remyelinating agent to repair old damage. Whoops. And we also need a neuroprotective agent. Um, and so those are uh, the, the elements that we're going to need, I think, to be successful. Julia would like to know if you have any thoughts on low dose naltrexone. So, naltrexone is a drug made to uh, block opioid receptors to help with like um, opioid overdose type stuff. And low dose naltrexone, which is typically like four or four and a half milligrams, is below the dose that helps with that. Low dose naltrexone uh, is not approved for MS. But some patients think that it helps them with some of their symptoms. Now, I use the same logic for acupuncture that I do with low-dose naltrexone. If you want low-dose naltrexone, it's not dangerous and it's not very expensive. As long as it's in addition to other things I know work, I'm happy to try it with you. But I don't want it to be the only option for therapy because I don't think that's adequate. Dr. Boster, is taking steroids while taking a DMT symptoms specifically, okay? It depends on how, when, and how often. So, so treating someone for an MS attack with high-dose steroids for three to five days in the setting of Kisimta or any other MS DMT, I'm not concerned about. The caveat being that during the pandemic, steroids like that will increase the severity of a, a subsequent COVID infection for about a month. And so we have to think about that. Now, the other thing to think about is um, Kisemta, like many drugs we've talked about tonight, is an immunosuppressant. And so I wouldn't want you to be on chronic steroids. Chronic steroids would further chronically suppress your immune system, and now we're stacking immunosuppression. So it really depends on how much, how often, um, and what kind of steroids we're dealing with. Marcy had a couple of questions. The first one is, um, have... Okay, is IVIG and plasma exchange used on RRMS patients or is that more for SPMS or PPMS? So I see um, those two things, uh, IVIG and phoresis used to treat um, refractory MS attacks. And I see it used in some clinics for SPMS and rarely, rarely for PPMS. Can a doctor tell us what symptoms might come up in exacerbation just by knowing where previous lesions have caused damage in the brain? So if the question is, can you predict where an attack will occur? No, absolutely not. Karen would like to know if infections are an issue on a CD 20s, do you ever space out dosing like the symptom every six weeks instead of four weeks? So, so an anti-CD 20 is the doctor term for a B cell depleter. So B cells have a hang tag on them, which is called CD20 or cluster differentiation 20. So that's the way that other cells can tell that cell is a B cell because it expresses CD20. And the medicines, uh, Ocrevus, Rituximab, Ublituximab, Ufatumab, they bind to these B cells at the CD20 receptor. That's how they find them. And then they murder the cells. Um, and so the, and I'm sorry, I'm, I, I'm trying to make sure I remember the beginning of the question. She wants to know if you're on a CD20, what? I'm, I need you to repeat it. I apologize. Um, let's see. 
Is IVIG and plasma exchange used for our... The next one. Um, can a doctor tell us what symptoms might come up in exacerbation just by knowing... The next, the next one. So sorry. Oh. Yeah, um, the next one. I've actually deleted that one already. Ah, okay. Well, okay. I, I apologize to whoever asked the question. We were talking about anti-CD20s, but I got so caught up in explaining what they were. I'm, I'm not remembering the question. I apologize. And they can always put that back in and I'll read that again. Um, Jen wants to know, how do I know for sure my first and only MS attack was not ADEM instead? ADEM. So ADEM um, is acute disseminated encephalomyelitis. And ADEM is kind of like a, a MS, but in multiple different locations all at the same time. And it's oftentimes a one hit wonder. It's a really, really bad thing. It happens once and it generally doesn't happen again. It also most commonly happens in children and it most commonly happens after an infection or a vaccine. So we can sort out, I would say 99.9% .9 of the time, I can sort out one from the other based on the history. And if you had a really scary multifocal attack with involvement of your entire central nervous system, um, we would then follow you. And so if you had that one event and it looked like ADEM, we might follow you not on therapy. If you then later develop something, well, then we would declare it as MS and move forward. Interestingly, in the pediatric MS literature, ADEM does not qualify as the first attack for MS. And so they make a distinction. Your neurologist should very easily be able to sort those two things out. And if they can't, they should be able to sort it out prospectively by following you for the next couple of years. Thank you. Bridget wants to know how many IUs of vitamin D do you recommend your patients take? They currently, so, well, she currently takes 4,000 IUs daily. However, she's heard that you could safely take more. And she lives in Canada, she wants you to know. So she's obviously vitamin D patient. So, so the number uh, that I use is based on your laboratories. So I don't just randomly give people vitamin D. I check a level called a 25, a vitamin D 25 OH blood level, right? So I get a lab and the lab comes back and it tells me your vitamin D level and below 50 is bad and makes MS go faster. We want it above 50, but we want it below hundred. So between 50 and hundred is like the sweet spot. And on average, I give Ohioans who will have very similar weather to some parts of Canada, you know, it gets cold in the winter and stuff, um, not a lot of sun. And I give most Ohioans around 5,000 international units daily. Now, some people, that's not enough, and we have to give them 10,000 daily or 50,000 weekly. But again, I wouldn't just randomly go taking extra vitamin D. I would ask the GP or the, or the neurologist to check a level um, to see where we are. Catherine is asking if you could recommend a book. This is a great question too, Catherine. Can you recommend a book that would teach an MS patient about the neurological system and all the mechanics about how MS works and how modern treatments work when she searches Amazon for that much is really before Ocrevus? Yeah, um, I'm not aware of a book like that. Um, but I will share a couple of resources. So there's a really cool doctor named Brandon Bieber, uh, who is an MS neurologist, uh, practices in California. Um, and he wrote a book about resilience in MS. Um, and it's a phenomenal book. And so um, if you're looking for a contemporary book about MS, I just, I just think that's a really well-written book about some amazing people with MS. So I'll just throw that out because I think he did a hell of a job. Um, I was frustrated with the, with the lack of reliable information on the interwebs. So in 2015, I started to develop content and I make a YouTube video every Monday morning. I did yesterday. Um, and I do a live stream every month. I did one yesterday. And uh, those are really intended to educate and energize and empower people impacted by MS. Now it's not a book, um, it's about 550 videos at this point, but you could check out my YouTube channel. Uh, and that's a location where I do answer those questions. I talk about the latest and greatest. For example, Ocrevus, I have 20, 25 some videos on the topic. So, so that's a place. Um, there are other online resources like that that are more contemporary than textbooks. 
Um, so uh, my friends at MS Views and News have a repository of lectures. You know, I'm sure that on the MS Foundation website, there'll be links to prior lectures where the who's who in MS is kind of talking about their areas of expertise. And so that's an area where I would encourage you to up your game. Mm-hmm. Oftentimes when a textbook comes or when a book comes out, uh, the, the, the field is beyond that, you know, because books are they take a long time to be written and published. Mm-hmm. And if um, people were to go to our YouTube channel, everything is there. Yeah. We've been going back for quite a long time. So, awesome resource. Is there a way to improve cognitive dysfunction? And what would you recommend? Did you say cognitive dysfunction? Yeah. yeah. There's lots and lots of ways to improve cognitive dysfunction. So, pick a number between two and 15. Deb? Uh, two. Two. All right. We'll do two ways that we can improve cognitive function. Um, And let's not do drugs. We'll talk about non-drugs. Okay. The very best way to improve cognitive function is to improve your sleep. So we need eight hours of undisturbed, restful sleep, not three or four hours, um, but like eight hours. So if you're not budgeting eight hours, that's that's a start to budget for eight hours of sleep. And we really need to work on sleep hygiene because the bed is for sleeping and sex. It's not for reading your phone or answering emails and stuff. And if you aren't getting adequate sleep, you're massively disadvantaging yourself the next morning and it will 100% affect your cognition. So we take sleep very seriously in MS. And if you have sleep apnea, if you have restless leg syndrome, if you're getting up to pee all night long, if you have spasms and pain waking you, we have to treat that stuff or it will destroy your thinking and memory, all right? So that's one thing. A second thing, um, just to continue on a theme, is cut sugar out of your diet. And if you think I'm crazy, you're allowed, but try it and then call me back and let me know because time and time and time again, I have found that when I clean up people's nutrition, they think more clearly. I'll throw in a third one as we wrap up tonight. Depression is very, very common in MS. It's twice as common as in the general population. And when you're depressed, you can experience something called pseudo dementia, which is a doctor word for the depression is making it literally hard to think clearly. When you treat the depression, the cognition massively improves. And so there's been times where I'll put someone on a Lexapro or a Wellbutrin or a Zoloft or something like this with goals of improving their cognition. Now, Again, in reference to my YouTube channel, I have 20 plus videos. I have an entire playlist on cognition and MS. So uh, I have all kinds of tricks and tips that you can look at there. Thank you. And we are at the end of our time. We do have quite a few questions left. I think the best thing would be for people to take their question and put it in. If you respond to the email that you got reminding you of this tonight, um, then if you would be kind enough for us to send them to you, maybe you'd be kind enough to respond. Yep. I'd be happy to. I'm also more than happy to come back and we should totally do this again. Um, and we can, uh, we can tackle more questions. I, these are awesome. outstanding questions and this is such an, a dynamic group. I would love to come back. Wonderful. Okay. So that is the end of our time. If you've missed any part of this conference, it has been recorded and it'll be available through the MS Focus Facebook and the YouTube channels. Reply to your registration email, as I said, for information on how to access recordings or to sign up for our newsletter about upcoming events. Our next teleconference is going to be on Thursday, December 1st at 3 o'clock p.m. Dr. Adam Schaefitz will be presenting the topic of MS and qualifying for disability. He is really quite good at helping his patients navigate the various systems, so I'm sure that those that attend are going to benefit by his information. Um, As you leave today, a survey is going to appear on your screen. Please take the moment. It's really only going to take you about a minute to fill it out, but that really gives us the idea of what's important to you, what's really meaningful, so we can make sure to present those things for you. Our sincere thanks to all of our attendees for your participation, and especially to Dr. Aaron Boster, who really takes his time out and does this for us every other month, and we absolutely love it. And obviously, by the number of questions, everyone else does too. So good night, everyone. We look forward to seeing you again. Dr. Boster, thank you, thank you, thank you. 
Deb, thank you. And to MS Foundation, you guys are an amazing organization. I'm so glad I got to work with you. To everyone who's on the line tonight, happy Thanksgiving. Um, God bless and go spend some time with your families. Thank you. Have a great night.